Who's heard the word multi-dimensional before? Who would like to become multi-dimensional? What if I told you you already are multi-dimensional? There's a lot of terms thrown around in the ascension movement, the transformation to the fourth density, the fifth dimension, all those buzzwords of this uh, paradigm shift. But becoming conscious in the astral is a huge transformation in consciousness because it is actually changing, taking what is unconscious and making it conscious. And Greg Doyle is already multidimensional. So he has an incredible amount of wisdom to share with us that he is sharing from an experiential perspective. That means that it's actually his nightly experience. And this man is simply like a beacon of light for all of us in the sphere of consciousness, in the conscious movement. Greg's written a book on this topic called Awakening the Giant Within. I've really appreciated all of Greg's support leading up to this event. He's been absolutely fantastic. And he has a lot of different events around Brisbane where he's teaching people to do this. He is an authority on this subject, not because he wrote a book on it, but because he actually can do it himself. Please welcome the Astral Avenger, Greg Doyle. Thank you, Anthony. Can everyone hear me then? I like this. Okay. Um, well, it is true. It, it really, oh, the best way to start is to start at the beginning, essentially. <laughs> And it, it was uh, 17 years ago, I remember it was, um, it was March the 13th, 1999. Um, essentially a ball of white light. It's funny because I've heard a lot of things talked about balls of white light in this meeting. And this is the first summit I've actually attended because I stick, I sort of, I'm kind of a newbie to all this. It just happened. Um, I only came out a few years ago when I wrote my book. Okay, I don't want to, okay, cool. Anyway, um, I'll tell you how it started. So it was March the 13th, 1999, just before dawn, I'm asleep, as you would be. I was living in a small apartment in Vienna in Austria, where I was a musician. I had no interest in this subject whatsoever. <laughs> Didn't know what the subject was. Um, the ball of light seemed to come from the direction of the window. And I remember it woke me up and I thought, well, this is, this is interesting, bless you. And it, it came in, <laughs> and then it seemed to come into my forehead. Now, as I say that, I knew that I was asleep and I knew that I was woken by this ball of light. It came into my forehead and then it seemed to collect, it was a round ball of light and it seemed to collect all these triangular shards of light that were behind my eyelids. I've since read that they're called phosphenes. And these are, these are like the um, electro, um, electrostatic stuff that's sort of sometimes behind the eyelids. It seemed to collect all that electricity together and it came into a focused uh, circle of light. And then it also flooded my heart. So I felt really, really good. Um, what's the best way of saying it? I just felt really like at home or loved. It was just this incredible flooding of light into my heart. And then I felt this wind started in my ears and I felt there was a feeling of an invitation. Words were not spoken. It was a feeling of, do you want to come? And I thought, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next thing I'm in this, I'm going at warp speed with wind in my ears, really loud wind in my ears, yet I have no body. I'm going down this, there's like sections of tunnels, incredibly fast, winding like a hose. It's really real and I'm knowing at the time that this is a pivotal experience that is going on in my life right now. I don't know what it is. I end up coming out, just when I think, well, I notice there are different passageways to the left and right. Just as I think that I come out to the right, and I'm in the atmosphere of a very arid planet about uh, 50 meters up, incredibly clear, ultra high definition. And I'm looking around, uh, there's like, it's kind of like desert, but there's these buildings in front of me, they're very tall structures, towers, opening up to massive um, disc-like buildings on top. Uh, they weren't flying saucers, they were actual buildings fixed to the ground. <coughs> Many, and they all had hundreds of windows in each of these buildings and many of the windows had lights on and many of the lights were off and I was, it was the real feeling of, it was like a dusk kind of thing and I just thought, okay, there are others. That was the feeling. And I felt also a little bit that I was home. That was a strange feeling. And then I felt myself come back into my waking mortal coil kind of thing 
And I started crying these tears of kind of ecstasy and I thought, well, what is this? And um, the next day I knew something had happened and, and like I was living in Vienna as a musician, I'd been trained as a musician, I hadn't, was not interested in the ET experience, not interested in spiritual stuff. I had meditated uh, since being a student to, for stage fright because as a performing musician you can imagine it's pretty tricky getting up. So I had meditated purely, for, uh, purely to be relaxed uh, because I, I couldn't believe the, the, the connection between the mind and body and how you could be anxious then 10 minutes later you could be relaxed. For some reason that fascinated me. Um, so I'd meditated pretty much on and off all my life but I hadn't looked for anything like this, didn't know what had happened. The very next night, I close my eyes, I'm not even asleep, and the light comes again. I open my eyes, it's gone, I close it, it comes, so I don't go to sleep. But it doesn't flood my heart, I'm scared. And I think, well, um, I'm not going to go this time, I don't know what's going on, am I going crazy? A few nights later, and this was all in a, a, in a very quick spate of very experiences that continue to this day, but I'm relating the, the major experiences to you. A few days later, these vibrations come, so just before dawn I'm woken by vibrations. That's normally the way when you astral travel, your astral body will be woken up by vibrations. So, and I'll get into what's happening with all of you when you sleep a little later. But, so these vibrations come, wake me up, and all of a sudden I'm kind of transported to a place a little bit like this. Very cosy, I remember it's a corner, corner table, there's a guy and a girl there, a guy with dark hair, a woman with um, blonde hair, she's in her 40s or so, and they're looking at me. And once again, this is very, this is ultra real, I'm sitting there, I, I have my total consciousness, I know who I am, I'm Greg Doyle, whatever, blah, blah, I have all that. And once again, it's the feeling of ultra real. And this, this came to define the experience for me, because it's much more real than this reality. And that was really the sticking point for me. And, and for a while, I almost went mad with that. And it has changed the way I see this reality, of course. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting there at this table and these, this guy and this girl start to tell me about myself. And I'm looking at them going, what? And I know it's related to the first experience I had, but I don't know how at this stage. And uh, they're telling me all things about myself, kind of making sense. And I think, okay, I'm out of here. Uh, I go back and I feel the vibrations. I'm back in my bed and I go, what was that? I just, that was weird. It, was, it didn't hurt or anything. It wasn't scary, but I just thought, I don't know what's going on. I don't want that. Close my eyes, back there again. And then I start asking questions. I say, where are we? Oh, we're in Gwyneth. And I go, as in Gwyneth Poulter, huh? Yeah. I'm, I'm cracking jokes. And they sort of laugh a little bit, kind of. Uh, one of eight worlds. And I'm going, what? And they're telling me this stuff. And I'm just, I'm just thinking, this is too far out again. I'm leaving. I leave again. Uh, years later, I was to, it hasn't finished yet, this actual experience, but years later, I was to research Gwyneth. There was actually a place in Wales spelt E-D-D -D at the end. Um, it's pronounced Gwyneth in Welsh. And it was a place of, in the Middle Ages, of mystical significance, which was interesting. A lot of this kind of confirmation came up throughout the experiences. So I'm back in bed and I'm thinking, whoop, and then I'm back, close my eyes, straight away I whoosh back. And this time I'm in a field with the female um, guide, and she was to guide me over the, the next few years, she still does. And um, it's a beautiful field and it's so otherworldly, as in it's so real. There's the grass, everything is, it's like um, a beautiful sun and everything's just flowing in the grass and it's just an absolutely beautiful scene and she's talking to me and then she says, she's telling me about auras, which I never really heard of. And around her I'm seeing all these colours and I'm seeing all these orbs of light in her and I'm going, wow, this is amazing. So, however, <laughs> I'm still pretty freaked out, as you can imagine. It was beautiful, but I'm thinking, what is this? And I kind of think this is my experience, and I make a kind of slightly disparaging comment just to see how she reacts. And she sort of casts a little wry smile, then she looks at me very closely and says, Greg, why are you so sad? And I come back from that, and it's like when, when a message is given to, to you in the astral, it, it really it drives home. And this is like an arrow into my interior. My whole energy body is going when I didn't even know what an energy body was at that stage. And I'm thinking, why am I so sad? This is obviously some, something's going on here. And that was when I realized that there was some perhaps spiritual significance to what's going on. And so over the last while, I, I, over the time after that, I thought, well, um, oh, I should click onto that. Yeah, this is what happened. Uh, my next astral experience 
there is the vibrations come again I recognize it so I'm sleeping at night it's hard to fully I say it rather glibly now at the time it's crazy I'm lying in bed vibrations wake me so all of a sudden my mind is awake particularly centered in the heart the heart is vibrating very very quickly it's not I've experimented it's not the physical heart it's the energy of the heart heart chakra going absolutely crazy and funnily enough the astral body is the fourth uh, body of the energy hum of the human energy system and the heart is the fourth chakra so it's related to the heart if you think of that first experience with the energy coming into the heart too it's like an opening of some kind anyway I didn't know all that then but this vibrations going on and as I come out uh, often you come through a void or through a kind of a mist I come out through a mist and I hear my own words spoken from a higher from a higher kind of um, frequency kind of like through a resonator I hear my own voice say who am I and I hadn't thought of that question next thing I see myself exactly as I am about two feet away from me like in full 3d and I'm thinking whoop okay <laughs> then there's a slideshow and once again the wind in the ears often with our sort of experiences you'll have wind in your ears and there's wind in my ears and there's a slideshow and my eyes and I get younger and younger and younger until I'm a little boy and then I disappear and the eyes are always staying in the same place it's fascinating to watch yourself morph like that then there's um, um, a Chinese Mongolian man an old man very weathered face and I can still see him any astral experience you have is etched in a memory that is far more real for want of a better word or that really stays with you compared to the shifting sands of of mortal memory for like it's a different memory that's there you can just like as I when I talk about it I see it you know anyway there's this is Mongolian man he gets younger and younger and the eyes stay in the same place and I'm and I'm watching and he goes, becomes a baby and leaves and there's this African medicine man with his arms out and he's wearing all this regalia and I'm going whoa this is freaky because he just looks really charged and he's a medicine man and he's looking at me same eye things wasn't so old would have been in his 30s gets younger and younger and younger disappears then the next one was, I'm looking, because the, there's, there's also a landscape behind these people. The next one, it was an earth, and there's a guy with a very long head, a very long, slim body, eyes are in the same place, getting younger and younger, and I freak out. I'm not into that whole thing, the whole ET alien thing, that wasn't on my radar at that stage. It just wasn't on my radar. And the funny thing is, as I, as I pull back toward um, my body, which you can abort at any time. Uh, often some of you might have had um, sleep paralysis and that's when the energy body has not fully reunited with the physical and now I never get that. I used to get sleep paralysis a lot but I never get anymore. And so as I pulled back into my body I heard a, I heard a voice say intermission <laughs> and um, I think Damien was mentioning the humor of the ET experience and there is a bit of humor out there. They're, they're, it's kind of funny and that was a funny thing to say I thought at the time. Once again, a few days later, a kind of an answer came. Now, someone said to me, Greg, I think that I knew, I knew um, a psychotherapist in Vienna, and she said, I think that could have been a past life regression you had. Now, I never really believed in past lives. I did not believe in them, but I didn't think about past lives. And my whole body, once again, you know when your body goes, you know when you get that energy thing going through you, now I finally get it like times... 20 <laughs> and when I know that okay that's relevance and it was the feeling of I'm much more than the scars and the traumas in my life and that's why I showed that shot was actually um in Victoria because I like surfing day before I was about to go overseas and I shared some DNA with a reef when I was underwater and <laughs> so my wife was most impressed that I carried those scars with me on the plane to to Europe um, so I realized that I was much more than this person Greg Doyle and it kind of made sense I'd always also felt a little bit out of sorts a little bit different a little bit separate but somehow there's something was dropping off me and I realized that there was a lot more than just my story as a human being and it kind of made sense then and things were going on now this chap this is a great story because people say yeah but, but, but what started the out-of-body experiences how did it happen how did it happen now I would, call, I would call myself a, a naive kind of cynic. I, I was in Vienna, I had, a, I had a sore shoulder, I'd moved a grand piano upstairs with someone, it wasn't a good idea, it was a grand piano. And um, I couldn't shake it. Someone said, why don't you go and see this person, she does um, 
energy stuff and I thought, yeah, well, well okay, I'll go because no one could seem to get rid of it. So I went along and she said, and then she just moved the arm very gently and, and said, okay, um, it was gone, the pain. And she said, you had an energy block. And I said, what do you mean energy block? Not in a nasty way, but what? And she said, yeah, you had a block of energy. And uh, now it's okay, I, I do Reiki and that's okay, but at the time it was like not on my radar. And um, I said, do I have any more energy blocks? And she said, yeah, sure. I'm coming back. I just thought, I couldn't, I just fascinated this could, could shift. Then I went back, the second session not much, the third session, I remember my solar plexus went crazy, I think, I forget the word always, but it's a, some uh, emotional somatic, somatic release, yeah. And, and my, my solar plexus sort of went hyperdrive and I turned onto my side and started screaming obscenities and seeing childhood things go past. And look, as a kid I copped a fair bit of physical abuse, so maybe that was coming out, it was the feeling of even the therapist backed away from the table. I said, you're safe, it's okay. But I just had the feeling it had to come out and I was really screaming, you know. And anyway, and then the next, I'm, I'm coming back. I thought, this is interesting. Uh, next session I come back and she's drilling her fingers into my gums. And I want to mention this to you because people talk about what can bring this on and, and, um, and we'll, I'll get into a lot to this later on about the human emotional body. There's a lot more to the human emotional body than we realise. So she's, uh, I say, why have you got your fingers inside my mouth? Um, anyway. And she said, well, you don't store, you haven't processed anger correctly. And we're going, okay. So she's got her fingers in there for quite a while. I'm thinking, I hope she washed her hands beforehand. <laughs> um, that night I go home and my, uh, as, I go to, as I go to sleep, my, my gums, they're actually stretching and they're burning. And I'm, I'm saying to my wife, who was, who was then my girlfriend, I'm saying, look, I, 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 this is terrible. I'm just, I, like, my whole jaw is on fire and it's cracking away and growing or something. Seriously, the next morning, this critter is in front of me, a holographic black wolf, green eyes, not always growling, sometimes growling, that's why I've got the growling one. <laughs> and he's in front of my face and this continued for three days two nights three days I had a black holographic wolf in front of me I'd go about my normal mortal duties <laughs> um, and he was often going <laughs> and um, I broke down I, I was really in tears and I must say through all this money my wife is sitting over there has been fantastic because she's just so open to the whole thing and I think she probably put me on that whole path anyway probably subconsciously but anyway it was a shocking time now this is interesting. Um, I had um, also an ex-flatmate at the time who I'd been sharing with. We had a, an argument over a power bill and I found myself after a couple of days having a fantastic argument. In the past I hadn't argued too well. I, I would kind of opt out. And I found I was able to, uh, in the thick of it, keep my sanity and say what I wanted to say. After the argument the wolf moved forward, licked my face and went into the corner. <laughs> Now, I think Mary mentioned shamanic stuff, I mean, that, that's a, you know, and I'm not interested in shamanic stuff, but it was a, it was a black wolf with so vivid green eyes, and I've tried to find this wolf my whole life on the internet, and I never did, however, and this is all just preceding the first astral exit. A few days after this, I'm teaching English also to groups of foreign, adult foreign students in, in Vienna, and a woman walks in, this is about a week later, a woman walks into the room with exactly the same wolf on a t-shirt. She's all grand. I'm, I look at it and I start, my, my whole body starts to go. I'm, I'm recognizing the whole energy thing. And I'm looking and I go, whoa, 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 what do you do? And she says, I'm a, Re I'm a Reiki master. <laughs> and I said, what's Reiki? And then, I, and then I ended up doing my training with her in my first level and ended up becoming a Reiki master. Now that's what you call bizarre synchronicity. The, <laughs> like who can figure that in terms of time? Like, yeah, what we'll do is let's chuck the wolf in there because he's going to go there. And, um, forget it. There's no logical... Anyway. So that, I, 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 I couldn't ignore that in terms of that must have, I think, that precipitated the astral experiences that I started to have. Um, okay. I was getting adventurous at this stage. I've been out of body a few times and um, if it, I, I can't talk about all the experiences because I talk for hours. I've had a lot of them and, and you can read them in my book though. And there's an interesting story why I wrote that book. Um, but I'd... I started to cotton on to the idea that what I was doing was astral travelling. And I'd heard that you could actually not only get out in other dimensions and meet sort of weirdos, okay, that's okay. Well, actually, they were very, very nice people that I met. And, yeah, <laughs> respect. 
Um, but that you could actually, um, you could actually leave your body in this realm like a ghost and see what people are doing and sneak around. I did a lot of sneaking. <laughs> and um, there are beings out there who, in a nice way, say, don't do that. But anyway, the first time, to put it mildly, I tried lots of things. Anyway, um, so I'm, 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 I'm in a hotel in Munich and, I, and my wife, my girlfriend at the time, uh, it's my wife now, Monica. I'll just say Moni, otherwise I'll keep on saying because we weren't married then. <laughs> she's back in Vienna and she's, in, she's, in, uh, she's at home. I'm thinking, I really want to go and visit her. So I'm, the main thing was, and is to imagine your body outside of your physical body. So with every ounce of your kind of mind, and I, my mind is now very different to what I thought it was. My mind is all through my body. Even as I speak to you now, I'm inhabiting my body and beyond, not just there. <laughs> so... I'm doing these exercises, nothing really happens, I think, eh, I go to sleep. Uh, I get up to go to the loo in the night, I think, hang on, there's something amiss. And I turn around, I see my body in bed, and that was the first time. And it's funny, when you see your physical body in, when, you, when you're outside your physical body and see it, you're sickened by it. <laughs> really, because it's like clay and it's, you see all the, the alleged failings that you think you have. Um, and, and maybe I'll get a chance to talk about that later, but you see just in the tilt of things through the astral eye, you can see much clearer and you realize that we think we're so imperfect, we think we've made mistakes and of course you're seeing through another eye, so you almost don't want part of that. In the beginning I just couldn't look at it, but it actually sickened me. So I thought, okay. And then the next thing, a naked woman walks through the room, she walks through the wall and I say, hello, who are you? And she says, I'm from England, keeps walking. <laughs> So I think, okay, I'm going I'm to experiment here. This is going to be fun. I go to the wall, put my hand to the wall and just whack straight into it. Can't, can't move through it. I think, okay, just relax. I know there's my physical body there. I must be out of my body. So I very gently put my hand through the wall, as he's doing now, but he opened the door. <laughs> and I proceed to move through the wall. I see a couple in the next room with their, with their physical bodies there and these kind of spirit bodies just drifting a couple of feet outside of it. It's really interesting. Next thing I'm thinking, okay, I want to visit Moni. I fly out, I'm in a void, and this often happens in the astral, an absolute black void. It's funny the connotation of black is negative, <laughs> but it's just there's nothing there. Next thing coming at me is this sound and it's an om, but it's more an om, A-U-M. I'm not a Buddhist. Not into that, but I hear this om, tremendous low, almost metallic, like a basso profundo male voice, but way lower than that, and huge. And had I not been so fascinated by this sound, I would have just escaped, because it was pretty full on, suspended in this nothing, infinity nothing, and then hearing this sound, incredible. Next thing, I'm flying like Superman, I'm over a building, I stop, and for some reason I'm stopped over the top of a like a bird's eye view of a building, I think, okay. And I'm through the wall of the Viennese apartment, I see my girlfriend, I see Moni there, and she's also just hovering outside of her physical body. I go to wake up, hi Moni, hi, and goes back to sleep. You want to you come with me? Yeah, and goes back to sleep. Moni, come with me? Yeah, goes back to sleep. Come with me? Yeah, goes back to sleep. Not going to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> then I'm back in my body again. Now, once again, verification, a few days later, I see the exact same picture of this particular building. It was called the Millennium Tower in Austria. And this was the first shot taken after it had been constructed. And I thought, hey, that's what I saw. It was on the front page. So it was like for these beings had, had shown me what was going on. I started to think, this is a guided experience. It's not just me. This is actually a guided experience. So what I found out was the, the next time I started to fly, I actually, and I'm going, like, you've got wind in the ears, there's a lot of power on your uh, forehead, or a lot of energy, and I turn back and I actually see, not looking quite like that because I couldn't find the picture, but it was, um, there was uh, um, a creature, a being holding me by the ankles. This being was, looked like a diamond shaped man or woman, it was a faceted kind of person, trans, translucent being. And I looked at it and I thought, whoa. Uh, fa you know, faceted like diamond kind of thing. And then there was a voice coming once again through a resonator, it was sounded very uh, like electronic voice. I didn't understand the words but I knew the meaning. The meaning was you don't need to know this. 
And then as I put my head back, it kind of hurt. And I thought, I don't need to know this, but why did I look back then? <laughs> and I realised a lot of it was that kind of thing. Don't get obsessed with this. And often the messages I get in the astral are not as... We're, we're a very verbal civilization, Very verbal. And a lot of the stuff in the astral is beyond verbal. Of course, it was the feeling of, I did need to see it to know not to get obsessed in that. But it's very much... Um, the experience is that we're actually flown when we go astral. There's actually guides out there all around us all the time. And so little by little, my life started to change. This guy appeared literally in my stomach. And um, I found that, and as I said, I'm not really into to Buddhism. I research it later, but there's actually, it's actually called the Buddha, the laughing Buddha, B-U-D-A-I. And he doesn't actually have much material stuff, and he's often laughing. And I found that when I... I was becoming kind of non-reactive to these experiences, like really quickly. And like um, someone would tell me a terrible story about themselves and I'd just feel him choking. I'd go, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And he'd be laughing, you know, like, you know, someone's died and he's laughing. <laughs> and um, even one woman, I was living in Spain a few years ago and this girl just, I have, as you can imagine, unusual people coming up to speak to me and uh, she didn't even know what I did, but she was just telling me all of a sudden about her suicide attempt. And I thought, uh-oh. And I started to chuckle. And she looked at me. <laughs> and then I went into a full belly laugh. And she started to laugh. And then everyone at the table just started laughing because I was watching. And that was the end of the conversation. It was the feeling of, okay. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, this one started through, and as I said, all these memories are just engraved. They're more than memories. Uh, this one started with a dream, and they're not often through dreams. Now, normally it's always through a vibrational start, but it did go into vibration. So I'm in a dream, I'm crossing a bridge in the dream, and there's a guy there, or a girl, um, short, bald, in a silver um, kind of bodysuit, spacesuit androgynous being. And I go up to them, it's in a dream, and I seem to know them in the dream, and I go up and hug them, give them a really good hug. I know I'm really well. And he or she pushes me away, didn't really want the hug, not that much, and just said, Greg, let me show you something. And then the vibrations come and wake me. Normally that doesn't happen, but it can happen through dreams. And there are ways you can control it through dreams too, which I'll get into later. So, the next thing, I'm looking through my brain. That's how it feels. And there's lasers of light coming in and it's like dentist drills. It's so loud. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if I can take this. It goes bzzz, And I've got these lights coming into my brain, lasers. And I'm thinking, well, this is actually really uncomfortable. I'm going to abort. I'm about to abort, then it stops. Then all of a sudden there's these really strange instruments or machines, very modern things being shown on like, a, like an invisible carousel, one after the other. And I think, oh, that's interesting. No idea what that is. Then the next thing is very interesting. There's a little screen being fitted. My, the upper right hand of my vision, there's uh, four little corners of, a, of a, like a digital video screen. I, I see it going... And then there's all these like hieroglyphs. I didn't read, and they're going... Really quickly. And it feels like little coins dropping into my brain. It's not an unpleasant experience. And that was the first real feeling of um, extraterrestrial intelligence messing around with me with the technological kind of thing. And it kind of harped back to my who am I with the alien and the first thing going to that. So I realised there's, there's something going on um, that is outside of the human experience. That was, for me, real, very interesting to feel the technology. In the end of that one, was I just started to hear people talking downstairs. I thought, uh-oh, that's going to wake me up. And then I was flying back to my body. But what I found is the whole time thing doesn't really matter because often I'll hear my guides or people talking to me in the astral. And as I open my eyes, because I like to experiment and go into full wakefulness, the voice goes really quickly. So the whole time thing in the astral doesn't really count. It's a different, it's not linear. Interesting. Um, There'd be a certain vibration that would wake me up and I'd recognise it. It was a vibration that also my sister has, which is interesting, my older sister. Um, and it's kind of a metallic, not a very, it's a screeching like jets. See the ships before we enter, the massive ships. For want of a better picture, that picture is very close. Um, all these um, naked astral bodies were being flown into these ships at night, huge ships. Uh, inside it was kind of plate metal. 
um, pretty sharp, um, as in, you know, very modern kind of stuff. Very, very real once again. The people who inhabited the ship were tall, white skin, white hair, weird eyes. They spoke telepathically. And I was on the ship, and I was sort of nudging people going, oh, this is pretty interesting. Isn't it? And everyone's walking around like a zombie. And um, it's interesting, there, there's a lot of stuff going on in the astral, as you can imagine. I'll, I'll, I'll get into this further. Some of it sounds a bit sinister, but if you get beyond that whole polarity thing, it, it just is what it is. These people, um, they, were, they were mainly guys, but um, very tall, over seven foot, around seven foot tall. Once I, I was kind of walking around, a lot of humans there, and I go out a little portal, a little door, and I'm on a piece of ground, but it's not earth, I'm going, well, this is interesting. And then a guy is standing there, one of the tall whites, and he says to me, you can leave whenever you want. This is through his mind. You can leave whenever you want. You can even kill yourself. All we, all we need is access to your energy, and we always have that. And at that moment, I notice I have a little bracelet around me. And it's interesting, because I'm not into sci-fi. I'm not into, I don't watch that stuff. <laughs> um, after a while, I, I kept going back there for quite a while, and I was, I was trying to tell people, you know, this is really weird. And I found to stay, that, to stay conscious there was very, very hard. I had to really try to stay above water. There was a real feeling to, to go unconscious. We had these massive tables we'd be eating food at. I remember once we were about, to, and the, the cutlery was perfect, and the food was actually very good. But anyway, <laughs> huge tables, and um, I was hearing a cow being slaughtered um, in a room close by. And I stood up, and I said, where next? And that was the last time I was invited back. I never went. Um, and what I found is that there is, uh, the feelings were that there, there uh, later on I see more evidence of this, not because I asked you, just because I saw it. But um, it was a feeling that the, this kind of sleep, sleepfulness that we have as humans, um, by our passivity on a certain level, we've allowed ourselves, due to contracts, and I'll get into that later, to be usurped in some way, and this it will get to it actually gets the relevance to the human energy body, which is actually very charged, and is actually an appetite for certain beings. Anyway, I'll come back to that later. Not all was bad out there. By far, the, mo uh, the majority of experiences I've had were fantastic. One time, I was I'd, often I'd back away from the earth because I didn't want to go into another um, dimension. I wanted to stay in this the astral or the closest dimension to 3D Earth, which looks like the 3D virtually. And I'm backing away, from the, backing away from the Earth and I go out to the distance of the asteroid belt um, between Mars and Saturn, I think. Anyway, I'm out there and I see all of a sudden my mind, in the, in the astral, you have incredible vision. You can see all around you. Your five senses become one sense that is very amplified. So your eyes can go wherever they want. I see these triangular craft on the inside of an asteroid. And I think that's interesting, and I have the feeling they're protecting us. I think they're protecting us. From what? Uh, the next thing I see, a massive ship. It's like a big white ship. It looks like a big white whale, actually. And it's got this writing on it that's sort of um, cir circular with... This, um, it's kind of almost like a stenciled military writing. And um, the feeling is that it's... I know in a, in a moment it's Galactic Federation. Now I wasn't really into that and then I researched later and, and apparently people talk about the Galactic Federation. In an instant, I'm kind of really, I mean it's so beautiful because you can zoom out with your eyes and see all the, the life going on in the cosmos and if you want you can go to that. It's really fantastic <laughs> a state of being. And Anyway, I come back to my body and as I'm pulled back to my body I ask the question, why are you not known to us as a planetary collective? And it was even a question I didn't know I had. And I hear a, a, um, a male voice actually speak to me very calmly, and it says, because you continue to kill your own. That was interesting. And I hadn't really thought on that subject. So there's, yeah, a lot about perhaps why there hasn't been a wholesale... Because I think often when you get into the, the I'll talk about the different realms of dimensions, but in the astro realms are really thought realms, and this is often where uh, we perceive monsters, a lot of our fairy tales are in the thought realms. And um, you have instant thought becomes manifest, and uh, if, if you take thought that with a very, very high emotional charge, that's not, not altogether 
particularly stable environment. So anyway, there are all sorts of things going on. Now, this is kind of a funny slide, but what I used to find at the, at the, end, of the, um, at the end of the bed, often elevators would appear. I'd go out of my body, and there'd be an elevator at the end of the bed. I'd get in the elevator and go up the elevator, and there'd be eyes looking at me through, like, cracks. Sometimes two pairs of eyes, sometimes three, sometimes one. I'd go higher and higher and higher, like I was being assessed, which I didn't appreciate. <laughs> I come in all sorts of things, I won't get into that, but one particular place I went to, which is still almost difficult to talk about, they, were, they, were, they, seemed, they looked humanoid, they looked human. We'd sit around a table and discuss issues through the mind. I had no idea of what they were talking, to be honest. It was way over me. They were lovely people. Um, as I said, they looked human, but they seemed, when I looked at their fields, because I went back re repeatedly to visit them, um, they seemed to have no ego. You could look straight into their eyes. There was nothing blocking. Um, and when it, when it came my time to talk, I thought, what on, what on earth am I going to say We're around this massive table? And I found myself talking very clearly and lucidly about the inequality of resources on earth leading to the problems we have. In a nutshell, I talked a lot longer, very clearly, about stuff that I didn't know I was going to talk about. It was really amazing. Anyway, I remember the last time I saw them because I knew I wasn't going to go back there and I said, I'm not going back. And as you can imagine, back on Earth, I just couldn't wait to get out of my body at this stage. I just didn't want to be part of that whole thing. And I remember they said, look, you'll come back, you'll come back again soon, but you've got to go. And a lot of people talk about that, the idea of being pushed back. And I was coming to terms with what was going on, but anyway, um, it made me... Over time, I started to analyze the feelings I had when I would leave my body and come back. And one thing, one beautiful experience was I was on a, a very lonely little planet. It was beautiful. I remember the, um, it was a stony surface. You could see the horizons actually much closer. It was a small planet. I was walking on it. Uh, two big moons there. I remember it was a big reddish moon. That's my picked that picture. And I remember meditating in the astral on this planet. And it was this feeling of incredible release of any anxiety. I had this feeling of, wow, life is not a test. I thought, this is, this is great. Um, it was the feeling that um, all we have to do is let go, and that, that it, in fact it was a service. And I, I really looked into my mind, and it was kind of like to be away from that, uh, the human collective consciousness, just for the little crack in time, sort of opens up things. The, 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 the automated, the... the um, the, the, the reactive is kind of expelled from you and, and another light comes in. And so over time I'd really start to analyse my uh, mortal mind as I came down into it to see the changes. And one of the biggest things was that, that you really lose the fear of death. I'm not going to get into it, but once I asked to see my own death, and that was interesting to watch as well. So you can go, past, you can go forward and past. There are so many stories. But this release of fear, and I realized in, in, the, in the mortal realms, the amount of fear that is there, you know, that when you wake up in the morning, the fear of the car drive, the fear of losing loved ones, the fear of losing a job, the fear of lo losing a house, is this con and it's driven by society, this driven by a banking system, driven by a, you know, taxation system, whatever. It's, it's part of our story. So that was a beautiful experience, being, and I had a lot of initiations on planets, that's interesting, out there. Um, just when I thought I had the game scun, how am I going for time? There was a time, when do I finish, anyway. Um, this really tested me. I found myself going into the void again. I'd come out of my body and for want of a better picture, it was like a witch, but her whole body was crawling, absolutely putrid smell. Uh, the archetypal witch, so scary, even the eyes were moving with creatures. And she was hurling energy balls at me. And someone said, this sounds like Buffy, the dragon say, or whatever. I said, I don't watch Buffy. I don't, w I don't know about Buffy. But anyway, I woke up with a really sore shoulder because I got whacked with this energy ball on my shoulder. And I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. Night after night, I'm out there. I think I've got to do something because I'm actually physically hurting from this. Either I'm going mad or I get help or I handle it on my own. I started getting good at getting the, the balls of energy and firing them so they'd intercept hers. But I could never make a direct strike. Then she said to me one day, this went on day after day after day. This was my astral experience. Nightly sleeping experience was going out, having this person. <laughs> my sanity was really tested. 
Eventually she said, she called me by name, she said, eventually she said, Greg, you're getting good at the whole defending thing, aren't you? <laughs> okay. We went on fighting and then she was right by me and this happened. Her face transformed and I, for some reason I felt this incredible release from my heart and it wasn't a conscious decision but I felt this phenomenal empathy for her. I don't know why because she was right by me and it was really disgusting. Her face changed and she said, you see Greg, it's all the same. And I realised in that moment the concept of evil what is actually the face of light seen through our own shadow and even that shadow does not exist. It's a misconception, a misunderstanding. It is the face of love. So there was a tremendous release to know that there is no evil. And since then I haven't been hassled. So in many ways it was like a computer game. I was kind of being tested. But I wouldn't call it a test. It was fun on many levels and people say but these monsters you've seen, I've seen many. Um, I think the banking system is much scarier. <laughs> this, and now this was interesting, I was um, camping, um, I knew something bad was going to happen, even though in the end it was great, going camping and surfing in, in Torquay because I was living in Melbourne and I felt this dread and I said to Moni, I said, okay, something's going to happen, will we go? Okay, I want to see what's going to happen here. You can feel it. You become very preemptive when you go astral a lot because everything happens in those, those realms before it comes in the physical. So I drive very carefully. I'm on my first wave and then it happens and I'm watching myself as I hit a step in the wave. My knee slips. I hear a, a tear in my leg. It's dangling pretty funny in the water. Go to the hospital. I'm in the tent that night. It's all up. Um, he said, you've got six weeks on crutches. Then you'll have to have an operation. I thought, I'm lying there and I think to myself, I know I'm a perfect being. I know somewhere in my template, it's perfect. Because this, for me now, to, to, to remain sane, this is the illusion because it's not as real as those other realms. For me, this is literally the illusion. And not to put it down, it's a game of energy. And so I'm lying there and I've got this mantra, I just felt right to say it, I deny the illusion of my injured leg, I give thanks for my perfect health. I said it over and over again, I thought, because you can pass a mantra into the astral, and I'll get into that in a second. I kept on saying it, nothing happened. And then, all of a sudden, um, it was after dawn, I thought, okay, nothing's happened. I caterpillared onto my stomach, I was lying on my back, I caterpillared on my stomach because it was hurting a lot. As soon as I went out on my stomach, this bull roar starts up, I hear vroom, vroom, and I think, hang on, how can I have astral vibrations, I'm awake. I start to hear the Lord's Prayer spoken through my own voice through a resonator. I was brought up a Catholic but not practicing from the age of seven. I don't even know the Lord's Prayer. Every time I got to those two lines, they kept repeating over and over. My, the resonator got louder and louder and I'm thinking, I was scared because I'm awake. My body was lifted off the sleeping bag, lifted up off the, off the mattress, literally suspended and put back down and then I felt all these fingers all over my knee like really moving like crazy, but I'm awake and I'm freaking out and I abort. Um, a bit of a wimp, I should have kept it going maybe. But anyway, after 10 days, I'm mowing the lawn and thought, hang on, I can walk. <laughs> and I didn't have to have the operation. So I healed very quickly. And that was really when reality altered in my mind. I started to realize there's actually magic happening here. There's this interfacing going on and, I, and you can have something to do with it. So this is the place of miracles, if you like, and also you think of mantras and prayers in those religions that really mean it, rather than for respectability's sake. Maybe there is something in that. Um, I wrote the book. Now this was a fascinating story because this came out a few years ago, and that was my coming out. Now, 18 months before it, I was meditating, I had a strange tweak in my brain. I came out and said to Moni, something has happened to me. I couldn't think of words, I couldn't put one sentence together. Uh, I couldn't remember the names of people in my family. This was in 2011. It was that bad. And I thought, what am I going to do? I was still teaching a bit of music at that stage, doing Reiki, whatever, but I, I had to rehearse everybody's names beforehand. I couldn't hold a conversation. People were going, this is a bit strange. I used to chat a lot. I was the funny man. I was the clown. <coughs> I decided to start to write a book because that way I could string a sentence together. And that was how that started. And, then I wrote, and, then, and also, it, once again, guidance in the strangest way, pushing a certain way. And I learned, I, ha I realized I had to give into it. So that was my life now. I'm going that, people would think, weirdo way, but actually in my life, it's much better now. So um, that was my coming out, writing the book. 
interesting, I was um, going up into the ether, I saw a band of fear around the earth, there were UFOs, black helicopters, and it was a massive fear, and I heard a voice say, do not get bogged down by conspiracy. For the next year, I was bogged down by conspiracy. I never thought about conspiracy. <laughs> and I realized, okay, that was the teaching. Part of enlightenment is seeing what is there, but then you've got to transcend. This is a lot of the um, tools I learned to actually leave the body consciously. Lucid dreams are a great way. You become, it's almost like a um, self-perpetuating mechanism. You can become more lucid when you try astral exercises. From lucid dreams, you can often see things in your dream realm that are more real than others, like a person. You focus in on that and blast through. I'm being quite quick now because I've got to move through. But there, there are ways, and I've, I've learned to also teach people. I've had some experiences where people have had conscious out-of-body experiences, and they actually really change for the better because of it. Oh, one amazing, I've got to mention this to you, that I realised that the creative ecstatic surge, scientists call the Big Bang, is actually all through us, and that we're much more than pieces of meat that spend money. And um, <laughs> one day I was thinking, I want to take this to another level. And I said to my wife, I'm going to try an experiment on you tonight. She, she had a, a bad leg from a, an injury earlier in her childhood. And I, my, my intention was to go astral and to call in universe, healing from the universe. That night I got out. I didn't know what... I, I, it's an intelligent universe. You don't need to know the ins and outs of it. That's one thing I've learned. I went out of my body. I'm above her body. I say energy, uh, healing energy from Monty's leg. Next, I'm, I'm thinking something might come down. Next thing, her leg explodes. She wakes up screaming. I wake up screaming. I'm in my body. We're all screaming. <laughs> And her leg opens, a, ho a hole opens in her leg. For the next year, the scar tissue had calcified and was coming out like little bits of bone. So, but after that year of pretty bizarre stuff, her leg, the pain went away. And I just thought, wow, that was immediate manifestation. And then you think of the thoughts. And so you realize this realm is very muddy. It's muddied up. But you take a clear thought in the astral, it's very, very powerful. Quickly, just the emotional body. What I realized is, my emotional state is very different. Um, when you're in the astral, you don't carry emotions because there's, it's a very reactive environment. If you're scared of something, uh, the archetypal fear of whatever that is will come and scare the bejeebies out of you, which I had a lot of those. Emotions are not helping you. This is where we're changing as a species. This is bogged in the human reincarnational experience. Feelings are a different thing. They will always support you. And there's a lot, there's a lot in that. For instance, the astral fire, they often talk about the astral fire. The realms closest, the, the human 3D, the astral realms, and that's where often people in the afterlife get caught because they're obsessed with a certain thing, maybe anger or certain emotions. So it's really our choice to go beyond that emotional state, beyond that reactive state, and then we can choose to go higher and higher into other realms. Once again, if we take that reaction into the immediate thought realms, we'd have absolute chaos the way we are. So, one thing before too, I did see that that, that level of um, don't get bogged down in conspiracy, there was a definite contract between certain extraterrestrials and humans to keep us suppressed. So it's up for us not to fight that, but to, to transcend it. And I've realized that if you add to the energy of the fight, you'll just add to the energy of the fight. There is no fight. It, it's, it's to transcend is the key. And so this is... Um, You've got to think who is being served, and I've actually seen beings, it sounds like a weird sci-fi, but they're actual beings who gain nourishment from our anger, and they perpetuate this anger in our realm. The trick is not to let it touch you, and I found more and more I become transparent. It just doesn't touch me, and even in my dream life, when I wake up, I let the dream go on, I let the drama go on. So I realise now, you don't take part of the drama, you can transcend it if you don't like if you don't want to have a mortgage, then go and buy a little bit of land and put up an, an eco hut. But you don't, you can't fight certain things because it's perpetuated in you to keep fighting, to keep it growing. So, um, and this is the last thing. What I've realised is that I've heard my higher self speak to me so often, and other fantastic beings, and I realised that this higher realised self of mine is helping me wake up. All indigenous cultures talk about not just Australia, about the dream time. From my point of view, this life is a dream, it's a, it's a play of energy, our role is to be authentic. 
and to wake up to our higher selves, to wake up through density to our higher selves, but we may need to let things go on the way. And really, for the next shift of consciousness, we may, let to, we may need to let go what we think is being human. We may need to look at that whole idea of what humanity is to move to the next step. And I realize, that for me, my purpose now is, is to be transparent. Even now, as a look at you, my, my experience of the world is you. I, don't see, I can see my hands, but I can see more of you than my hand. And vice versa for you. So we're all one of the same. And there is no disconnection. Even with those who, politicians who you don't agree with, often when you meet them, you have eye contact and they're, they're lovely souls. And um, if you can get around the idea that there is no evil, that there is no fight, then we have more chance of waking up to our true destiny, if you like. And I think back... Before the astral experience started and I was meditating, I once heard a very clear female voice and it said, there is only joy. And I realized that my whole life would be spent proving that. So thank you very much.